This is Debbie, and welcome to the Offbeat Life Mentorship, where we go beyond sharing inspiring stories to helping a listener get to the next step of the life they truly want to live. A listener of the Offbeat Life podcast is given the opportunity to be on the show and interview a past guest and myself so they can pick our brains and learn our trade secrets. On this episode of The Offbeat Mentor, I invite back Johnny Sweet, who is a freelance writer and editor driven by adventure. Her journalistic pursuits has taken her all around the globe and has been published in National Geographic, Forbes, Thrillist, Huffington Post, and so much more. Johnny has successfully created a thriving career as a paid travel writer and has inspired our listener, Cassandra, who is a Brooklyn-based writer, tour leader, travel planner, and solo adventurer extraordinaire. She has observed Johnny's journey and has admired her persistent and work as a freelance writer. I was fortunate enough to introduce these two ladies and allow them to engage in an incredible conversation in order to get Cassandra to the next level to becoming a paid travel writer. If you want to be a part of this new segment, make sure to visit theoffbeatlife.com or email me at guest at theoffbeatlife.com for more information. Listen on to find out the incredible tips that Johnny shares on this mentorship episode. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Johnny and Cassandra. Thank you ladies for joining me here in this beautiful day at the park. <laughs> Love it, it's beautiful today. I'm so happy to be here, thank you. So I am really excited for this week's mentorship interview with Johnny from Cassandra because Cassandra sent me a message and she really enjoyed the podcast. And one of the person that she really admired was Johnny. (laughs) And we, we all know why. And so I'm introducing the both of them for the first time today so that Cassandra can ask Johnny some more of her trade secrets that she wasn't able to share with us during the podcast. So Cassandra, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. So what was it about Johnny that was really inspiring to you? And what was it about her that you wanted to know more about? Well, I love that she's doing something that I'm interested in doing more of, Mm -hmm. travel writing. But I loved her spirit and her energy (laughs) and the fact that she's in New York. I know we're all about social media and online and building friends and networks online. But I just I like meeting people in real life. I'm kind of old school that way. I'm blushing. (laughs) (laughs) So, Johnny, how does it feel to know that you have this fan of you? Well, I, you know what? Last time I did the podcast, um, I had quite a few people reach out to me, and I, I was so excited about that that you know this has turned into more of a conversation. I'm so excited to meet you in person, and you know, offer some advice in person because I think those in person connections are so important. Like you're saying, getting off the screen and in real life can actually help us foster bonds and and really help everyone grow. Um, You know, I think there's room in this industry for everybody who wants to to do it. So honestly, that's what I really wanted to do with this podcast is to connect people and having this new segment, having this segment where I actually get people together who can help each other out is giving it so much more meaning for me and hopefully for all of you, the mentors and the listeners. And I really want to help all of you guys grow, not just myself. So this is so exciting for me to see. Yay! Me too. And I'm so happy that people have been contacting you for the podcast, Johnny. That's so exciting. Yeah, it's really fun. I've been talking to a couple women on Facebook and somebody else on LinkedIn. You know, I just love the excitement around doing this and being your own boss and and writing about things you're passionate about. You know, that's really exciting for me. So I love if I can help anybody else do it. I'm I'm game. I will say that I had on my to-do list to contact you. And then I contacted Debbie and she was like, oh, well, let me just connect you with Johnny. I'm like, oh, okay. That was on my to-do list. So thank you for taking that off my to-do list and and making this happen in such a pleasant way. I'm always happy to take another thing off of somebody's to-do list. That's really a huge priority for me. So Cassandra, I know you have a lot of questions for Johnny. Can you give us some of those questions that you would like to ask her? Sure, sure. So top of mind, in terms of in real life and in enjoying life. I'd say one of my favorite aspects of traveling has always been escaping from 
social media and daily worries and such. And so before I started leading group tours and having a travel planning business, I enjoyed going two to three weeks without being on social media. But now it is integral to promoting my business and getting new clients on there. And I'm wondering how much do you allow yourself to just enjoy a trip versus promoting it online or being stuck in your notebook taking notes all day long? Yeah, it's definitely a balancing act. Um, I think you know, I think there are a couple kinds of trips I take. If I'm traveling for vacation, you know, I'll usually do some like Instagram stories and also take a lot of pictures to post later, but I'm not so heavily invested in my phone and sharing every little moment. I like social media, but I'm not super into it. So I don't feel like anything's hurting by me not posting a ton while I'm there. If I'm there for work, like if I'm on a press trip or I know I'm going to get a story out of this, I am posting a lot more and um, I'll be taking a lot of photos for reference. So, you know, there's, there's photos that are beautiful and you want to share those. Then there's photos that are for reference and these will be things like signs and descriptions in a museum and, and just little things I want to remember later so that when I go back and write my articles, I have some reference material. And I'll also take a lot of notes on my phone using the notes app. Um, I like to travel light. So I, I don't want to bring anything extra that I don't need. I don't want to bring a ton of notebooks and things like that. So I think it is a balance and you kind of have to think about what the purpose of the trip is. And I think especially for you running, running tours, that social media is probably more important. But I think you can take the photos and remember that you can post them later or like post them at night in your hotel room when you're, when you're not doing anything else. So you're not missing out. Thank you. And a little secret, I do post them later. I know when I got back <laughs> from Malaysia and Thailand, it was two to three weeks later, my friends were like, wait a minute, didn't I see you in Malaysia this morning? And now you're in front of me in the West Village. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, well, uh, that's another thing, right? With social media is that we see things like for myself, for example, I usually schedule them and people will see me in like Ireland and I'm in New York City here in the summer. You really have to create content if you're going to focus on social media that you will have for weeks on end. So I have scheduled posts for like three weeks or even a month in advance and making sure that the grid looks beautiful because it's all a part of it. And then also your caption is what's going to get people beyond your images, right? To go to your website or to the trips that you're doing. So it's really great to use especially if you're doing trips like you are doing, Cassandra, to get them to the next level besides just your social media. Mm -hmm. So Debbie, who do you use for scheduling those? I use the app called Mosaico. And then there's okay. also Planoli. So you have to pay for both of them, but they're really helpful because it just takes a lot of stress off of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started using Hootsuite, okay. which I like. And I go back and forth between them. So I'm always looking to see what... Yeah. So the, the difference between that and um, Zayaco and Planoli is that you can actually plan out your grid. I don't right. know if you can do that with Hootsuite. You can't, but within yeah. Hootsuite, I don't know about those two, but within Hootsuite, you can do your Instagram, your Twitter, yes. your Facebook, mm -hmm. and it's really easy for writing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kind of over typing on my, yeah. my cell phone all day, cramped up fingers. So, <laughs> okay, I'll have to check those out. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. I just finished a two month bike tour in Cuba. And I had so many experiences that I want to pitch as articles. And they range from the adventurous nature of bike touring to touring as a woman to like all the unique stuff you can only see by bicycle. And I'm wondering, is it ever okay to pitch more than one idea to an editor? Even if I can see several of these pieces in the same publication, does it look sloppy for me to include several pitch ideas? First of all, your bike tour sounds really cool. I admire you for doing that. That sounds amazing. Thank you. Um, I don't think it looks sloppy at all, but there is a risk of doing that, like especially with a new editor who you haven't worked with before. I've I used to send like five or seven ideas, all totally different, and I can see the website publishing all of them. But when the editor hasn't worked with you before, they're very unlikely to be like, yeah, here's seven assignments, go for it. They're gonna test out one or two to see if, if you are compatible working together, if you hit your deadlines, if your style works for their site. The other risk of doing that is that it turns into this buffet style thing. Some editors, like even after you've been working with them for a while, you'll find that if you send them more than, let's say three ideas or however many you decide is right, they start picking the one or two they like, even though maybe all of them would work. And you're stuck with this pitch that maybe would have gotten accepted if you sent it a little bit later. So I think there's a strategy to how many you want to send at a time. But I don't think 
sloppiness is, is a risk that you're facing. I think that you're just not setting yourself up for selling the most stories that you can. So I would say space out your pitches a little bit. But I think it's totally fine to send one or two at a time. Within the same email? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just make sure each one is really polished, like ready to go. I, I would say you will look sloppy if there's obviously spelling errors or if they aren't if they don't feel quite right for the publication, it just seems like you're you're sending them, you're turning into like a dumping ground of ideas. And you don't want to do that. Everything needs to be really targeted. So yeah, start with one or two and, and go from there. And you know, you can have the backups ready in case the editor says, no, these aren't right, but keep pitching. You have three or four more ready to go. So you can start sending those. Do you have any rules about how many times you should follow up with an editor? I don't think there are any like rules about this except do it. Like you definitely <laughs> want to follow up. So many writers don't. They yeah. think, oh, the editor didn't answer my email. She must not want the piece. Mm -hmm. That is probably the furthest thing from the truth. Having been an editor myself, your inbox is insane. Like you have so many emails flying at you all day long and your workload is really high. So she might not have seen the email. She might have read it and said, oh, this is interesting and then gotten distracted with something mm -hmm. more urgent. I, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen that uh, have nothing to do with you or your idea or whether or not it's right. So the only way you can really get an answer is to follow up. And I would say, especially for online publications, following up a week later is totally appropriate. You don't want to follow up two or three days later unless it's a very timely story. And, you know, let's say you're writing about Labor Day and it's now the end of August. You're like, okay, I need to get this story out there now or I'm not going to be able to publish it. That's when you can start following up more quickly. But I would say feel free to send at least three follow-ups. And for your last one, I like to change the subject line and write final follow-up to just let them know, like, this is the last time you'll be hearing from me. So if you want this idea, let me know right away. Otherwise, I'm going to I'm gonna start pitching it elsewhere. That's such a great tip, Johnny, because even pitching, too, with brands and not just editors, it's really amazing how many times you can get clients by following up because a lot of people actually give up from the first email and then they're like they probably don't want me I mean that's happened to me I've worked with brands from a follow-up because they just said they forgot about the email or it was lost in the mail or whatever it was and then they want to work with you so always always follow up that's what's going to make a difference between you and the other person that didn't get it <laughs> that's that helpful. is so true yeah. yeah and I'm wondering what do you do when an editor initially expresses interest and then they go silent I'm worried mm. do you look pathetic if you follow up several times or is it the squeaky wheel gets the grease like okay yeah you've maybe followed up four times but but that's normal yeah I definitely think the squeaky wheel gets the grease mm -hmm. it's good to try and get an answer one way or another so that at least you have that connection made and maybe you can get an understanding if, if they don't want it why and how you can better pitch them in the future but I would say pitching or um, following up three times is totally fine and depending on the story you might want to follow up four or five times but don't follow up too frequently follow up once a week or once every two weeks you don't want to be popping in their inbox every other day because that mm. will make you look desperate <laughs> um <laughs> but following up once once a week or once every other week is totally fine what about if they initially express i had that i had a, a fairly large publication initially express interest they asked if I'd be willing to switch the tone of voice of the piece. I said, yes, absolutely. Then they asked for some pictures. I sent them the pictures. And then I heard absolutely nothing. And I followed up three or four times over the next year. What do you think happened there? I can't really <laughs> speculate what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it, it happens to writers, though. That is, mm -hmm. it's a frustrating experience. And you feel ghosted like you would on a date. You're like, well, what, what the heck is going on? Like, you, I thought you were into me and now you're gone forever. It's definitely frustrating. And you were totally right to follow up. You know, anything could have happened. Maybe the magazine pivoted their editorial direction. Maybe their freelancer budget got cut. Maybe they faced a, la a round of layoffs and that got very intense in the office. Um, I think there's like a lot of factors that really have nothing to do with your story or them wanting to work with you that could have affected their ability to, to um, commission this story. Don't take it personally. It is frustrated. Feel those frustrated feelings and then like use them to power you through and pitch somebody else. Like it sounds like you knew when to give up. You knew at some point, okay, it seems like they're not going to get back to me. You know, take a day and be annoyed by that. And then the next day, 
find like three or four other places that might be a good mm-hmm. place to send that idea to. The nice thing is you've already done a lot of the legwork. You got the photos together. You got the pitch together. You thought about different tones of voices for the piece. So you've done a lot of work already. Just put that work to good use somewhere else. Do you have any tips on how to find an editor's contact info? And if it's difficult to find it, are they then annoyed when you write them? Like, is it hard to find for a reason? Sometimes editors do make their stuff hard to find for a reason. If you're pitching a print magazine, you can find the editor's email in the masthead. It often won't say their email very explicitly, but you can see in the fine print at the bottom of the masthead their email format. So it'll say first name dot last name at company.com. So then you can just go up to the masthead and figure out their first and last name and you can you have their email address. Sometimes editors put their email addresses in uh, on their Twitter pages. I definitely do not recommend pitching editors via social media. Mm-hmm. That gets really annoying really fast. But I don't I don't think editors are often deliberately hiding their email address, but you know, they're also trying to limit how many bad pictures they're getting. So it's a balancing act. They they do want to connect with good writers. They need us. If if they don't have good writers writing for them, they have nothing to publish. So they do they are looking for good writers, but you know, it can be a bit of a treasure map to try and find their email address. <laughs> There are some like online resources like those Facebook writers groups, which I can put you in touch with. They have loads and loads of documents with editors' email addresses. So that helps a lot. So that secret women's Facebook writers group was another question. So (laughs) thank you for that. (laughs) Find me on Facebook and I will help you out. Friend me, I will help you out. Thank you. (laughs) Cassandra, how are you finding your editors right now? In some cases, it's looking through the websites, mm-hmm. and just like you said, it'll have the format first name, dot last name. Uh, but in other cases, I haven't been able to find it. Johnny, have you done, or Cassandra, have you done something like befriended certain people on social media to get certain information? Recently, I did just contact somebody on social media for the first time because it was an editor actually of Lonely Planet. And I spoke with somebody who used to write for them and didn't have this other editor's contact information and she told me to contact him Mm -hmm. on social media and I didn't I didn't hear back but we couldn't find his information anywhere yeah because that's really interesting how many contacts you get from social media and like LinkedIn and even Twitter and Instagram and one of the things that has really worked for me and for a lot of people is just friending certain people and then commenting and then just following up on them for a while because this is a long game you know and it's creating friendships and then you would be so surprised how many people they actually introduce you to even if it's other writers like Johnny like how many editors she knows already and if you're friends with her she'll introduce you to more people and then vice versa later on so it's such a great thing if you create a community you will allow each other to help one another in that way I'm slowly getting back into (laughs) social media that is very sneaky yeah (laughs) but I I got rid of my Facebook a number of years ago, oh, and wow. I just started a Facebook page last year. Remember, I said I have this love-hate relationship with social media, but I had so many people on my group trips to Cuba that were saying, oh, I want to repost the pictures and tag you. I want to share your page with my friends so they go on your trip. And I'm like, that's a great idea. I don't have a page. <laughs> and so I created a business page last year. They force you to create, um, to Personal. tie the business page to a personal page. But I only have one friend, somebody who went on one of my tours and I accidentally accepted. But he's so nice. He's so nice. He's my biggest fan on Facebook. So maybe you'll be my second friend, Johnny. <laughs> okay. You don't have to be active on Facebook, but you need a profile. Mm, I'm right. getting a, I would say at least 80% of my work is coming from connections via Facebook. Maybe even a higher percentage than that. Mm-hmm. I think writers in particular are putting themselves at an extreme disadvantage by not by avoiding certain social media platforms. Even if you don't want to be super active or post anything personal, I totally respect that and I understand why, but you do need to have it just to access the conversations that are going on. So I I definitely recommend revamping your profile. I I don't think you need to post anything personal. You can make your picture a little cartoon character or picture of a kitten or whatever you want, but it will give you access to those groups and calls for pictures from certain publications. Yeah, I have joined a couple of groups on Facebook to be part of it. I just haven't posted anything on that personal 
page. I put everything through my business page. Well, also, you don't need to, like Johnny said, you don't need to do anything on your personal page. Focus on your business page, right? Because that's when you can, if you 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 have a blog, you have a website, you have trips, that's where you put it all. And you'd be surprised how many people will be sharing that or finding you from your face, Facebook post from your business page. It's really interesting. Like, even with me, for example, because I have Google Analytics, mm-hmm. most of my traffic, surprisingly, I don't have a lot of followers on my Facebook page. I have like over 800 and on my Instagram, I have over 20,000. And most of my traffic is from Facebook. And it's ridiculous how much it is. So you would be surprised. I think LinkedIn is also an undervalued platform because that's really who you're going to find editors from, other writers who could also you can connect with. And that's one of the things that I'm telling people to start really utilizing is LinkedIn and Facebook. LinkedIn is such an underdog, but it's so important. I get like the highest levels of engagement Mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. So I've been like sharing articles that I write on there and and writing some commentary about it. And people will comment. You know, I shared a link to the last podcast episode we recorded and I got over a thousand engagements with it. That was really high for me. Mm -hmm. I don't have like a huge social social media presence. So to get that level of engagement was mind blowing for me. And editors sometimes reach out to me on LinkedIn Mm -hmm. because they see my work, they see my conversations that I'm starting, and they want to work together. So, yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably, at least for a writer, I would say second behind Facebook in terms of getting work. I've had a lot of people talking about LinkedIn recently, so I made a business page, and I think maybe one person has followed me so far. I haven't invested at all in promoting that. But my personal LinkedIn page is more about my background in community development, social justice, and food access. So I'm thinking, do I now just make it my writing page? Do I make a separate LinkedIn page? One is for the food justice work and one is for the writing. I haven't been sure how to navigate it, so I just haven't done anything. I don't know if I have great advice because I've never done that before. I've always been like, I'm a writer. This is Mm -hmm. what I do. Yeah. So it's a little hard for me to answer that question. I think it's good to be consistent in all your profiles. And Mm -hmm. I think that there are ways of finding a link between everything you're interested in and doing. And you can explain that in your bio. But in my opinion, I think it would look a little bit weird and sketchy for you to have like three separate LinkedIn yeah. profiles based on what you're doing. It almost looks like you have separate identities. So if you can get creative and link them together in some way, and it will require some creativity on your part because mm-hmm. they are different interests. But, you know, if you can find the links and express it in a clear way, people will come to your profile and be like, oh, I get what she's up to. Like, yeah, she seems interesting. Well, also you're doing community development and with food related, you write a lot about that. And even on your trips, you put that in there. So you can definitely find ways to put them all together. And those could be something that you've done in the past. And then now your current and your present focus is your group trips. So people are always interested in what you've done before and what led you to where you are now. So because of your experiences in food and community development, you're able to create these amazing group trips to Cuba and all over the world. And then one of the things that you do is focus on food as well on your tours. So that could be an interesting way to put those things together and make you more interesting as a person and why they would go to you for your trips is because you have these background from other aspects of it. It makes you an expert. Good call, lady. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for the self confidence boost this morning. <laughs> I'm going to kill that profile. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny, what do you feel was the first big opportunity you had and what led you to that? So I was thinking about this this morning and I think it was a piece I wrote for the Christian Science Monitor, I think back in 2013. And it was a piece about an Indonesian woman who was paralyzed from the waist down and she modified a motorcycle so that she could take her wheelchair on it and get around. It's really hard for people with disabilities to get around Indonesia. So this was really innovative, groundbreaking, especially because she was a woman living in a rural area. I think a few things came into play in terms of me landing that assignment. One, I think the biggest thing was exclusivity. Nobody else had this story. You know, if I were to write 10 things, 10 fun things to do in Indonesia on your vacation, there are thousands of people who could write that. Nobody else had this idea, and I had already made connection with this woman, and she invited me to come out and spend a few days with her and kind of see life through her eyes. So I had this very exclusive thing that 
I think had, you know, it was a small story, but it had a larger impact. And it, I think it could re be relatable and interesting to people around the world. So I think that it was just a really interesting topic. Um, the second thing that happened was, you know, as I was thinking about where to pitch this, I started asking around and somebody told me, oh, I wrote for the Christian Science Monitor. They're actually really receptive to new writers, um, which was amazing to me because they are an amazing publication. They're world renowned and they, they go into print, I think, like every week or every other week. And it's distributed around the world. I was like, okay, this has broad reach and they're open to new writers. I should pitch them. And I did pitch them and they were interested and we ended up working together. So, you know, I think if you have that really compelling idea that nobody else has, that exclusivity can help you land bigger publications that maybe wouldn't be interested in hearing your run-of-the-mill ideas because they have other writers to take them. But if you have something really special, they might be more willing to give you a shot. Especially on your trips to Cuba, you should be able to find some of these like really personal stories, I would think, since you're spending so much time there and talking to people. Think about like what local people are doing that's really interesting and different than you've heard elsewhere and how that might make a good story. You know, I've thought about that uh, because I have spent so much time there and I've met so many interesting people with very unique stories. And when I pitch them, either I don't hear anything back or I've had the instances where there's some interest up front and then I don't hear after a while. And this, I'm a bit disheartened by a lot of the stories I hear about Cuba. A lot of it is the same. Classic cars and beaches. That's what people want to read about. And it's, it's this big, beautiful, diverse island and people are not writing about it. Well, so then maybe this is your chance to be outside of the box and that's your thing now. You can show them what a lot of people are missing out on. They are. I just I haven't been able to convince the editors because I've <laughs> sent the ideas yeah. and they just haven't responded. Mm. It's really like a right place, right time kind mm -hmm. of thing. If you go pitching the New York Times, I mean, I've not been published in the New York Times, but I would expect that it would be very difficult for a writer who with limited experience to get published there. I did pitch my idea on this woman to the New York Times and I didn't hear back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's about finding finding a publication that that's <laughs> just big enough and open to new writers um, I think with a timely idea, there's no problem sending the pitch out to multiple editors and putting a note in there saying, you know, I've sent this to other publications, just so you know, only because this is a timely idea. Typically, you don't want to send the same idea out to various publications at the same time because you'll get two commissions and that gets really annoying when you have to tell somebody, actually, I'm taking this idea back. That's a quick way to burn a bridge but you can give time limits on this you can say okay if I don't hear back from you within a week I'm going to assume you don't want this idea and move on at least it gives you a chance to you know organize your workflow and have some control over this process that is so much outside of your control but expect not to hear back from people it's frustrating and it's about building relationships so mm -hmm. if you can I would say if you are working with people keep pitching them if they like the way you work and they keep assigning you stories, that's a fast way to build a relationship and you don't have to put as much effort into your pitches because if you can just send them a couple sentences about your idea, they'll be more likely to commission it because they know your work. So I think building those relationships, it's tough, especially at the beginning, but it's going to give you long-term benefits. So let's say you get the story, you send the article, and an editor takes far too much control over it and changes the story a bit too much. What do you do in that situation when you feel like it's no longer your authentic voice or it's it's reflecting the story in a way that you don't really feel is accurate? I think there are a couple things happening here. If you ever see your article is published with something factually incorrect, you should reach out to the editor and let them know. Don't put any blame on anyone unless you're taking the blame yourself and saying, I'm so sorry I missed this detail or I had a typo or something like that. Just very neutrally say, hey, um, there was a typo in this or this date is wrong or this person's name is wrong. Can you make a quick update, especially if it's online? If it's in print, it's going to be more of a back and forth as to like how you want to deal with that and how the publication handles corrections. If it's just a style thing, if they've changed the angle of your story or it doesn't read like your words anymore, this happens a lot to writers and a lot of people I know get really frustrated by this. It has happened to me a couple of times and I don't love when it happens, but I move on quickly because it's one of a million things I'm writing. I'm doing this first and foremost for the money. This is my job. I think writers get into a little bit of trouble when they get too precious over their words. So I think you need to understand that 
editors have a very particular vision for their publication and they often need to change writer's words to fit that vision and it has very little to do with your own writing style they may have loved the story but they're saying this isn't the right voice and tone for our magazine so i think you just need to get comfortable with that and grow a thick skin and not take it personally you know just look at okay did they pay me on time is my work out there does it have my name on it those are the really the most important things and if you feel like you're not you don't have enough creative expression and vision over your ideas i think that's when like a blog could be really useful nobody can change your words on your own blog so if you really have those stories you're deeply passionate about and don't want anybody to change them you need to publish them on your own so that you maintain that creative control i had a really bad experience with a publication that will remain nameless that my first printed magazine article ever they did not link to my website or social media as they said they would and then when it went out online a year later they linked to the wrong social media page and then refused to repost it with the correct link and i kind of gave them a piece of my mind and didn't hear it back unsurprisingly and i'm wondering is it ever okay to do that I, you don't want to burn bridges but i also feel like some responsibility of like calling people out like we have ethics and if somebody publication is not being ethical I feel I need to say something, but I'm wondering is, is how would you have dealt with that or is there a standard way to deal with that in the writing world? I mean, in my opinion, these things change all the time and you don't have a lot of control. It it's really frustrating if they promise something and they don't deliver. Super annoying if they get your name wrong or your social media handles wrong and they won't fix it. I agree, that is so annoying. But would I give them a piece of my mind? I don't necessarily think that's a good idea. You know, one of my like career mantras is don't send the email. And what I mean by that is how many times have you gotten an email that you're like, "Oh, that pisses me off. You're so wrong about this." And you want to just like write them 10 paragraphs back about how they're wrong and and just like how this whole situation is so messed up. That's not going to do you any favors, right? It might make you feel good for about 5 minutes as you send that email and say, "Great, like I told them off. I told them what's what." But it does not help you in the long run. Your reputation is everything in this business. It's better to stay calm, cool and collected. You might decide I'm not working with this publication anymore, but telling them off, it's not going to do you any favors. You're certainly not going to get more work from them. They're not going to be able to recommend you to anybody. You know, there are real problems with that. So, I'm not saying it's never appropriate to do that. There probably are situations where you might need to say something to somebody about something. <laughs> Um, I think you want to pick and choose those very, very carefully. Mm. One thing I like to do is when I'm like really angry about an email that just came to me or a situation, and I want to like tell somebody what's what, I will write that email, but don't send it. Like wait 24 to 48 hours, go back and reread it, and if if that's still really what you want to say and you still feel really strongly about that, send it. But sometimes writing the email. is therapeutic enough like you don't need to then go on and affect your career by sending it that's good tip just for personal life as yeah. well in, in yeah. dealing with friends and Well, we had talked about this last night when we were having dinner and this industry specifically is very small. It doesn't seem like it, but everybody knows each other. Editors know each other. So if you give one person bad vibe, they will tell somebody else and it'll and then what is it? you get blacklisted and no one will work with you. So it's Johnny said pick and choose. who and what you say like to people because it matters a lot especially if you're starting out in the industry and even when you're on top of your game it really matters like let's say you write for a cycling magazine and the experience doesn't go well and you tell them off and then you're pitching a nature magazine and you say oh i've been published in xyz cycling magazine you can see my work there that editor might know somebody at the cycling magazine and might shoot them an email just saying hey What was it like to work with Cassandra? Like, did you like working with her? Was her work good? And there's a lot of behind the scenes conversations mm -hmm. that go on and you never want them to be bad about you. You only want to give people a reason to say positive things about you, and that requires swallowing your pride a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So, don't send the email. <laughs> <laughs> Pick and choose your battle. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's good. That's really great advice. It's easier said than done. Yeah. I will admit. <laughs> I had never heard about Spacious until you mentioned it and it sounds so cool. Like after the podcast, I went and I looked it up. I looked at all the sites and I'm like, "Oh, that's so cute. It's cool." And I was 
looking into getting a WeWork space just to have a dedicated space and take part in some of their networking events. I'm wondering why you chose Spacious over WeWork. Do they have networking or was there something else that really drew you to it? They do have networking. Um, they have some like happy hours and some new member breakfasts. I haven't done them, to be honest, but they have a, a Slack channel for members as well where I have done some networking on there. I, I've made friends and I've also, I haven't landed any work from there, but I've made some compelling contacts that I think could be useful in the future. Um, the main reason I chose it is because I just felt like I might turn into a nutty person if I'm at home alone writing all day long. So I liked that it would get me out of my apartment. I liked that they had a location a block away from my apartment so that I could go home and like make myself lunch and come back or, or not if I didn't want to. And I found it to be a lot more affordable than WeWork. I think WeWork is really cool. And if I was running a bigger business, I would consider getting a space there. I, th I think they offer a lot of cool benefits. But for just a writer like myself, I didn't need the level of service they provided. And what they were charging for it was a lot higher than I really wanted to pay. So that's why I thought Spacious was a good middle ground. It had that kind of coffee shop environment and free coffee, good networking, plenty of locations around the city. And I think it was about a third of the price of the WeWork locations I was looking at. So that's why it worked for me. But, you know, I'm also thinking maybe I don't need it anymore. Like I'm actually getting really productive at home and not turning into a nutty person. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of isolation isn't um, bothering me as much anymore. So I'm, I'm wondering if I still need it. I have it for this month and I'm like gauging how much I'm using it and if it makes sense I'll keep it and if I'm not using it that much I might drop it. So everyone says it's really hard to make ends meet as a writer. Are there certain types of pieces that tend to earn more money than others like magazine pieces, food critiques, travel guides? A lot of print magazines are still paying anywhere from 50 cents to two dollars a word depending on where you land, those pieces are few and far between until you get very established. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not doing a lot of print work uh, right now, but if you want to make the big bucks, that's where you got to go. Uh, content marketing pays well, and it still allows you to write about things in your expertise. You can write about travel or food or whatever you're interested in, and you're just doing it for a company's blog instead of an editorial website. Often you're writing the same stuff. You're still interviewing people. You're still writing with a compelling voice and uh, doing research. So it's basically the same. It's just with a brand name on it instead of uh, an editorial name on it. I find travel pieces pay the least. I love travel writing, but I make that a smaller percentage of my workload because it pays less. Uh, I, I'm finding lately that health pays really well. Uh, if you can develop a good expertise in health and network with a lot of doctors who are willing to interview with you and, you know, become one of the go-to people that some of the health websites need writers for, you can make much better money doing that. And lately I've been trying to find intersections between the two. Like I just wrote this article about how to make friends when you're traveling and your social life is a part of your health. So I thought that that was a fun way to like marry two of my interests and you know, I've done stuff about like working out while you're traveling and things like that. I think the, the more you can marry your expertises, the better, because it's going to be interesting for you and maybe pay better than just straightforward travel pieces. So this could be perfect for you because you do a lot of cycling and hey. <laughs> I'll be following up with you offline. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> well, how would somebody get started with content marketing? I've heard people mention that in the past a lot. That's a tough one. I fell into it. It's not a huge part of my workload, but I have a couple of, of clients. If you have editorial work published, you can start pitching company blogs. They just want to see that you've had something published. It doesn't have to be a content marketing piece. I would say, say start reading content marketing, and you probably are reading a lot of it already without realizing it. Mm -hmm. Like if you're buying makeup online and you occasionally look at their blog, that's content marketing. Mm -hmm. It, it can be a little tricky to get your foot in the door, though, and it requires a lot of reaching out, very similar to editorial. You know, find the editor. They're, these editors do exist. They sometimes don't have an editorial job title. It might be community manager, I think. That might be wrong. You have, it's a little bit tricky to find the right person to pitch, but they often have less people pitching them. So if you can figure out where to go and send a good idea, you can very likely land an assignment there because they just have fewer writers. 
How many times do you pitch every week to a specific publication? I maybe am sending like three or four pitches a week. Mm -hmm. A lot of my workload right now is coming from assignments. Mm -hmm. The editors I've been working with just come to me and say, hey, do you want to take these ideas on? And then we negotiate deadlines and pay and that sort of thing. Um, and I go from there. That's nice because it takes the pitching work out of it. Pitching doesn't pay. You only mm -hmm. get paid when you land the story and write it. I try not to do too much pitching that I'm, I'm wary of or I'm worried like I might not get this assignment. You're better off pitching at first and then building relationships with editors who can maybe start sending you assignments. But I often pitch these editors who are sending me assignments too. If, if I have an idea that I think might be good for them, even though they typically send me assignments, I'll send them ideas too. And it'll be a, a back and forth. And we both get value out of that because then I'm writing about what I want to write about and they're not having to come up with ideas on their own. So in the last podcast, you talked about how you authored a travel guide for New York for National Geographic, which sounds incredible. I'm, <laughs> I, I want to read it. Is this online or this is a printed piece? It's print, and it's only in Italian and French right now. Oh. Um, they might put it out. In, I wrote it in English, but it was translated. So I don't know when or if the English guide is coming out. The way I got that, I, I found some random job ad online. I I can't even remember where I found it, but they said, we're looking for New York City experts to write this guide. I didn't even know it was for National Geographic. It was some German publisher. So I just sent them an email because at the time, I was an editor of some New York City travel magazines all about the Big Apple. So I really, I did have that expertise and I still do. And then I get some random call the next day from a German phone number. I'm, what the heck is this? <laughs> so I answer it and they're like, oh, we're working with Nat Geo. They're, they contracted with our publishing company to put out these guides. Do you want to do the New York one? And I was like, yes, absolutely. That That's amazing. I like almost didn't even believe it was true until I finally, like a year later, got the copy oh, in the wow. mail. And, like all the German stamps all over it. It was so cool. And that was a really proud moment for me. I, you know, I felt like I, okay, I'm really a travel writer now. Like I, I've landed in Nat Geo. So that felt really great. That's Congratulations. amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I have them like on display on my bookshelf. I'm, like, the Italian and French version? Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I, hope, I hope the writing came out well. I have no I idea. Do you have friends who speak French or German that could verify that for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel just about every travel writer feels they are an authority on their city and they would love to do a travel guide. Like, do you have any tips for people who will be interested in going that route? I think start off writing like smaller guides to build your expertise. So it's going to be pretty difficult for you to find a publisher to say, yes, write a 200 page guide all about New York. Like one, they have people doing that already. They don't need you. And two, you don't have enough clips to show them. So you need to at least have, I would say at least a few dozen clips talking about the best cafe is in New York, the best places to stay, really unique things that people haven't seen before. I had done a few walking tours in San Francisco that I that I wrote about for an app years ago and part of why the German publisher wanted me for the New York Nat Geo guide was because he wanted me to do walking tours and like plan out a route and write descriptions of different stops I had that kind of expertise they were looking for and I had gotten it on a lower stakes project mm -hmm. so you know write some walking tours like to, you could easily write an article on where to get the best Cuban food in New York, and you have mm -hmm. that expertise. Um, that would be a harder article for a lot of other people to write. So get as like niche as you can, write as much about New York as you can if your goal is to write a New York travel guide, and go from there. So my background is in community development, healthy food access, and so I was really interested to see that you write articles on both health and about travel. And I was wondering how that came about. So I kind of fell into health, or at least I thought I did. A friend of mine knew that her editor at Thrillist Health was looking for more writers, and I was looking for more freelance work. So here's another tip. Tell everyone you're looking for work. Mm -hmm. Like, don't be embarrassed about it. People will help you. So she connected me with him, and he started sending me assignments. And I found it really fun and interesting, and I, I liked the work. But looking back, I actually realized that I've been interested in health for a long time. I've been vegetarian for over 10 years. I started my career at a vegan magazine. I think like different parts of my life always touched on health. So I didn't realize it until very recently, but 
you know, a couple years ago, I was just able to hone in on it when an opportunity came my way. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's important to try new things. Like if one of your friends says, I know an editor at a gardening magazine who just needs somebody to write a couple things. Do you want to do it? As long as you feel like you can do it, do it. Like maybe you find out you're really interested in gardening. You might be a great gardening writer. You never know until you try. And I think especially when you're starting out, embracing any opportunity that you feel you're capable of doing and is a it's available to you, do it. Maybe you find you hate gardening writing and you stop working with them after three articles. Well, at least you have a couple clips, you got paid, yeah. and you learn something about yourself. So, you know, it was a mix for me. I've always been interested in health, but then an opportunity came my way to really dive into it. And I was able to leverage the work I did there to get a lot of health work at other publications. So when you're initially making that switch, say from health to travel, would it be okay to send examples of your health writing when you're pitching a travel idea to an editor? I think it's always better to send your most relevant work. Sometimes you don't have it. If, if you've never written about travel, but you've written about health before, that's all you got. So find the closest thing you have in your health portfolio to travel and talk about why you're sending that. You know, I'm sending you this article about this new medical procedure. I know it doesn't have anything to do with travel, but it shows my ability to do really good research, get compelling quotes from experts, and explain it in a way that's engaging and that people will understand. You know, show how this article and this body of work is reflective of your work style in general and your skills. And that will give them a compelling reason to give you a shot, even if you don't have dozens of published clips on a particular topic. I'm sure you talk to a lot of travel writers and new travel writers, and I'm wondering, you probably get a lot of the same questions. I'm wondering if there's any really important question that none of them seem to ask that should be asking or should be thinking about. When you're first starting out, it's really tough to structure the business end. You probably have all these ideas about stories you can write and places you want to write for, but the business end, it didn't come naturally to me. You know, I had to set up spreadsheets about like, who owes me money and when it's due and when I need to invoice and all of that. That stuff I find really annoying, but you have to set it up. You have to get organized. And I think a lot of writers don't think to ask questions about that when they're starting out because they, they're really just interested in the fun part, which is like mm -hmm. sending editors your ideas and getting the story, which is my favorite part too. But you do have to be organized on the back end so that, you know, come April when you're doing your taxes, it's not a mess. And as you scale up your work and you're like, balancing 20 assignments at a time, one of the easiest things you can forget to do is invoice. Mm. And what is the point if you forget to send the invoice? You're not getting paid for all that work you just did. So having your spreadsheets in order and tracking everything very meticulously, I think is really critical. And every writer does it differently. I talk to other writers about this all the time and we all have different styles. So you have to find what works for you. I think as freelancers, that's the main thing is when you're finally making money, because when you're first starting out, all the good stuff and the happy stuff that you really want to do is your main focus. And then you don't realize that you have to do the back end, the business part of it. And I think especially for creatives, that's what we have the most issues on is the business part of freelancing. It's so true. I find it so dry and boring. <laughs> Luckily, my partner loves <clears throat> That kind of stuff. So I'll sometimes have him go in and tweak my spreadsheets a little bit to make them, you know, a little more streamlined and less of a mess. But track everything. Track your assignments when they're due. Track when you sent that in invoice. Track whether or not they paid you on time. You're going to get paid late. And you need to make notes of who's consistently paying you late because they might not be worth working with for the long term. It also helps you see your, you know, how you're doing. Like, did you make more money last month than you're doing this month? And what can you do to keep improving? Tracking those kind of analytics is really important. We all do it on our websites, right? Mm -hmm. But um, there are other analytics to our business that are so easily overlooked, but they can give you a lot of insights as to what you're doing right. That's really helpful. I went to business school. I did not continue down that path for a reason, but <laughs> I really need to spend a bit more time on Excel. So maybe you can give me some tips. Yeah. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> you need help making a PowerPoint? I'm there. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This is so helpful. Anything else you want to share? Anything I'm missing that you think might be helpful? I always ask that at the end of interviews, and that's sometimes when the most interesting stuff comes out. But I just say, like, be persistent. Turn in amazing, consistent work every time. Like, you never want to give an editor a reason to doubt your abilities or your efforts or anything like that. Just deliver your best 
work every time and you will keep growing. As soon as you get sloppy, the work goes away. So communicate. If you're going to be late on something, let them know so that editors can adjust on their end and do what you can to avoid giving people reasons not to work with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, good <laughs> luck. You're going to do great. It, it just takes like a lot of perseverance. <laughs> This is so exciting. So, Cassandra, did you learn a lot from this talk with Johnny? <laughs> I did. I've been taking notes over here, and I can't wait for the podcast to come out so I can <laughs> listen to it again and share it with everybody I know. Because this was really helpful for me personally, but just like in general, for anybody interested in, in becoming a writer or advancing their writing career, this was really helpful. So thank you so much. I'm glad much. I could help. It's very generous of you. Very generous of you <laughs> to share your, your time and your knowledge with all of us. Well, I, I'm glad I'm in a position to do it. Other people were so helpful to me when I was first starting out so I'm happy to pay it forward and I truly believe like the more people you know who are successful the more successful you can be mm -hmm. competition isn't in my world is not really much of a thing in writing we all have something different to bring to the table and talking to your writer friends and referring clients to each other that's how you're really going to grow so you know be open with your ideas be open with other writers talking about who you want to work for and whether and be forward like can you help me get this assignment mm -hmm. people are more willing to help than you, anyone would realize yeah. everyone wants to help and it, it comes back and it's a small world if they don't then everyone will know no <laughs> <laughs> so cassandra can you give us a little bit more about what you're excited about now that you've talking to johnny and what else what other projects you're working on that you want to share with everyone yeah, absolutely. I run a travel agency, tour planning. Mm -hmm. I specialize in Cuba and Mexico, off the beaten track, do a lot of biking, hiking, food tasting, cultural engaging with locals experiences. And in part of researching these trips, I did this two month bike tour through Cuba. And there were so many amazing experiences that I want to share and I want to pitch to places. Uh, so this was really helpful in terms of thinking about like how I might structure the pitch and who I might send it to and how much I may or may not follow up. All of that was really extraordinarily helpful to me. And I want to I want to do travel guides in the future. And I have something in the works that I can't talk about just yet, but <laughs> perhaps on a future podcast uh, we can revisit that but but your your input was was really helpful for that too i'm glad um that sounds so cool and i have no doubt that you'll be able to land at least one if not many stories based on your two months biking through cuba that's such a unique experience and that's something you can bring to the table that no other writer really can yeah especially as a woman th there weren't too many women there i I have, I have two female friends who bike tour cuba on their own uh, but also as an american in the two months i didn't meet a single american bike tourist there and you meet very few Americans outside of uh, Havana and Western Cuba. So I do feel that I have a lot of unique uh, stories. You have a really unique niche. Yeah, for sure. So, Johnny, what about you? Anything exciting and interesting happening currently that you want to um, talk about? I am pretty sure I'm about to start a travel and wellness column on Forbes.com. Wow. So I'm really excited about that. One thing I like about that is they really allow their contributors to have a lot of creative control over what they're writing. I don't pitch an editor. I decide what I'm writing and I write it and it goes up. So I like that because I can, I can then control like my voice a bit more and publish ideas that I think are important and interesting and fun. So I'm super excited about that. Yay! Oh my gosh, we're excited about that. That's, <laughs> That's a column I absolutely would follow. Yay! Yay! So Cassandra, if our listeners want to know more about you, your trips, and what you're going to be up to for the next few months, where can they find you? They can find me at escapingny.com, like Escaping New York, but it's abbreviated, escapingny.com. My social media handle, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, escapingny. Perfect. That's really easy for us to find then. That's I love that awesome. name. I know. <laughs> You're lucky you got that. <laughs> I'm, lucky, I'm lucky I got that as well. But even so, but people like escape, escaping and why? Like, no, and why? Like, oh, should I have done NYC? I don't know. No, you're good. You're, you're good. good. Yeah. <laughs> They'll they get it. <laughs> what about you, Johnny? If our listeners want to know more about you, where can they find you? Yeah, so you can go to my website, johnnymsweet.com. Uh, J-O-N-I, M like Mary, sweet like how candy tastes. Um, <laughs> and uh, Johnny Sweet is um, my handle on Twitter and Instagram. Perfect. Thank you so much, ladies. I really appreciate all of this and for all the knowledge that you gave us and for all your incredible questions. Because that was amazing, actually, all the questions that you gave Johnny as well, too, Cassandra. <laughs> I was impressed. If Thank you, you. You know, a lot of people 
like, get annoyed by having tons of people come at them and say, like, can I pick your brain about this? But if you come to somebody you want to work with or learn from with a list of questions prepared, they're much more interested in helping. So yes. I thought that I was very impressed by your question. And oh, they're, good. they were <laughs> also you. really thoughtful yeah. as well. So they were very specific and very thoughtful. So thank you, ladies. I'm so excited. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> Fostering connections. Yes. I hope you enjoyed this mentorship episode with Johnny Sweet and Cassandra. If you want to be a part of this segment, make sure to visit theoffbeatlife.com or email me at guest at theoffbeatlife.com for more information on how you can be mentored. Hey, Offbeat family, I really appreciate you listening to this episode. I would love to hear more from you and what you think of the podcast suggestions on guests topics we can discuss or maybe you just want to be friends why don't we chat some more on facebook at the ob life or send me a message at hello at the offbeat i can't wait to hear from you